following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. As promised, I am back with the illustrious Hal Bach from the AP. How are you, sir? I'm good, uh, Ralph. I'm happy to be here with you. Well, I'm happy to have you. We've done podcasts together for going on three years now, and um, it's been fun, informative for me. You're terrific, and um, you've had a 43-year career at the Associated Press as a baseball writer. You wrote books. You taught after retiring from the AP. Uh, You've uh, had a very satisfying life, and a happy birthday, 80th birthday, Mr. Bach. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, I've had a, a... A very rewarding life. I have no complaints. I set out to do this for a living, and I was fortunate enough to be able to do it, and uh, I'm happy with everything I've done. Nice, nice. I want to talk to you about two things today. Um, First is the book that you wrote called Band, and um, it's about baseball players, uh, managers, executives, uh, bat boys, a whole bunch of people have been thrown out of the game over the years. Um, can you kind of tell us your experience writing the book? Was it fun? That's the. Was this particular book fun for you? That's my question. All writing is fun for me. I, it's a very rewarding way to go about my day. I enjoy writing. I enjoy it a lot, although I'm cutting back now at uh, my advanced age. But uh, I've always enjoyed writing, and um, I love baseball, as you do. And um, everybody knows about the the 1919 World Series and the Chicago Black Sox. And I thought to myself, there must have been other people who have been banned from this game, this wonderful game of ours. So I started doing some research, and one thing led to another, and now I have a book. It's called Band, Baseball's Blacklist of All-Stars and all silver ends. And there are some interesting names in there. I mean, of course, everybody knows about Pete Rose. Uh, everybody knows that Alex Rodriguez was banned for a year or so because of drugs. People don't remember that Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays were banned by uh, Commissioner Bowie Kuhn for, uh, for doing nothing more than trying to earn a living by working in a casino and playing golf with the customers. So that was a kind of a... you know how harmful gambling is because the owners of these baseball teams that uh, uh, banned him were gamblers themselves. That's oh, my God. Uh, if you started to look under the, uh, under the cover of these guys, I mean, uh, all of them, uh, I mean, lo- a lot of them uh, loved horse racing, loved the track, and uh, they gambled, and they, and they won and they lost, and... But the idea is you don't fix baseball games. You don't gamble on the game. Pete Rose gambled on baseball. There's a a sign in every clubhouse, uh, no gambling on the games. And the players know that, or they should know that. And uh, they're pretty much uh, straight and straightforward and and on the the high end, on the the high line of uh, baseball, and, and they don't fool around. But there was an era in baseball in the 20s right after the Black Sox and also before the Black Sox, when uh, gamblers were all over the place, players took money to throw games, and some of the players <laughs> were were implicated quite innocently because Judge Landis came along following the Black Sox scandal, and he just ruled with an iron fist. He didn't he didn't want he just would not accept any explanations. If you crossed him, you were likely to be banned from baseball. The, my favorite story about that is is one of the Black Sox players. They had a pitcher named Dickie Kerr, a young pitcher. And uh, he was not one of the players implicated in the fix. He was clean as a whistle. In fact, he won two games in the 1919 World Series for the, uh, for the Chicago White Sox. So he was clean as a whistle. But what happened to him was that he became a little a little greedy. He wanted more money from Charles Comiskey, and you just didn't do that. Comiskey was very tight with the, with the dollar, which is why 
we had the, the Black Sox scandal in the first place. So Comiskey turned him down when he asked for a raise of $500 after he won 21 games one year. And uh, Dickie Kerr said, okay, I won't, play, uh, I won't play for you unless you pay me that money. And they were at the standoff. And uh, Dickie Kerr went off uh, and uh, got himself suspended from baseball. Why? Because he decided to make a few bucks by playing for an independent team against players from the Black Sox. George Landis was outraged. He thought, this is the worst thing I ever heard of. Well, not the worst thing, but one of the worst. And so he suspended Dickie Kerr from baseball for life. Well, for life. For life. That's what that was it. You're out of here. And a few years later, that was, yeah, they, well, maybe not for life. You want to come back in the game, but you're not going to pitch in the major leagues anymore. So Dickie Kerr signed on to be a coach in the in the St. Louis Cardinals organization. The Cardinals, remember, were the first team to have a farm system, Brand and he was coaching at their lower lower level farm system, Class A or Class B, whatever it was. And he had a left-handed pitcher who was pretty good, uh, and this guy was on the mound one day, and he went to field a bunt. And he fell on his shoulder, and he, I guess he dislocated his shoulder. And in those days, uh, sports medicine wasn't what it is today. And he thought he was done. He thought his career was over, and he, he tried to come back, but he couldn't pitch. But Dickie Kerr, who was at that time his coach, said to him, you know, you can't pitch, but you're a pretty good hitter. Why don't you try another position, maybe first base, maybe the outfield? And so Stan Musial did that and became – a Hall of Fame slugger. So that was oh. Dickie Kerr. He recognized talent. Uh, and there are so there stories like that in the book. wasn't on the field. His contribution was behind the scenes, so to speak. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But th there now, are stories like that throughout the Did it come history. that he came back, he got the lifetime ban and came back? None right. of the other players that, from the Black Sox scandal could even appeal it from what I, I understood. They uh, no, they, they they never returned. I mean, they played uh, as he did. He played independent ball one year, and that got him banned. Uh, a lot of the White Sox players found semi-pro teams and stuff like that. Shoeless Joe Jackson, Buck Weaver did that, um, but none of them played organized ball again. The judge was an iron-fisted character, and he was. Don't forget, they were found innocent. They were found not guilty in court when they were brought up on charges, but uh, right. that didn't matter to the judge. Um, Shoeless Joe, how does he rank in your mind uh, compared to people like Trispeaker, Ty Cobb, uh, Babe Ruth, uh, you know, the greatest of the great? Right there. He's right there. He, had, he was a great hitter, one of the greatest hitters in the game's history. I think he had the the highest average, second highest lifetime batting average. Uh, and if you look at the statistics from the 1919 World Series, he had a pretty good World Series. If he was fixing it, he was doing it in a kind of a strange way. But Shoeless Joe was an illiterate, so he uh, he got swept up in this deal. Uh, he wanted to support his teammates. He he, he was a, a good team player. And uh, but he didn't know what he was up to, what it was, what he was doing. It was bad. Somebody wants to give you five thousand dollars. Well, I'm happy to accept it. But right, if you look at his statistics much. in the world, especially series, in, in those days, five thousand dollars. You bet. Was like bet. Uh, a lot Eddie Seacott got ten thousand dollars, <laughs> the pitcher. And yeah, uh, so you know, that's a lot of money. It was a lot of money in those days for players who were underpaid by Charles Comiskey. So right. that's what happened. Okay. Now, um, the book itself, how do you, um, when, it, when it's released, how do you publicize it? What, is there, are there book signings? What was that about? I did some signings. Uh, I did some appearances in libraries and men's clubs and stuff like that. Um, not as much as I would have liked, but uh, that's another story for another day. Uh, okay. it's, uh, 
it's available from Amazon, as everything else is, and uh, it's a neat book. I, I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed writing it. I enjoyed doing the research. It was a fun book to write, and uh, Good. It, uh, it's out there. Beautiful. Look for it, everybody. Um, Hal, you and I are two of the, the few New York baseball giants. You have to say that now. Remember, you had, had to say New York football giants. You had to, had to use football for the football team. Now you have to say New York baseball giants to describe the San Francisco Giants when they played in New York. And um, it seems like an awful long time ago when you think that you're 80, I'm 72, and Willie Mays is 88 years old, last surviving member of the National League champion 1951 New York Giants. Um, tell me first, are you as amazed as I am about how quickly time flies? Oh, am I ever. <laughs> it seems like only yesterday, believe me. Uh, I remember yeah. the 51 Giants with warmly, warmly. Uh, Willie, they brought up Willie in May, right around his birthday and my birthday. And um, I was 12 years old, and he was 20 years old at the time. So uh, I was tremendously envious of him playing in the Polo Grounds, playing for my team. And I remember that he had a very uh, difficult beginning. He went, I think, 0 for 23 or 0 for 24 in his first five or six games. And he wanted to be sent back. He told Leo DeRocher, I can't do this. I can't play here. And DeRocher said, shut up and go out to center field. You're my center fielder. And his first hit was a home run in the polo grounds against a pretty good pitcher named Warren Spawn. And from then, he took off and uh, became uh, the rookie of the year. And, and uh, he was in the on-deck circle when Bobby Thompson hit that famous home run. He had, the funny part of that is that he was in a rather bad slump at the end of the season. And his batting average had dipped, uh, I think, to around 274 or thereabouts. And I think he was scared that he might have – it all might fall on his shoulders if Bobby right. didn't come through. But uh, Bobby hit the home run that everybody remembers, and uh, and uh, that was how that uh, pennant playoff ended. And it was a very exciting time for this 12-year-old and that 20-year-old. And the uh, 30-something-year-old, uh, Russ Hodges, it kind of – Punched his ticket to the Hall of Fame. My God, I, you know, I, my dad was listening to that game on the radio because our television. We had a television. We were one of the few neighbor, one of the few people in the neighborhood that had a television in that year. But it went on the blink, so he had to listen to the game on the radio. And I was, I was disgusted. I was so fed up after this pulsating pennant race that went the whole season, and they were chasing the Dodgers. They were 13 and a half games behind, and it was going to fall short. They were four down 4-1 four in the ninth inning, and I was so angry and upset that I refused to listen. I just sat in another room in our apartment, but I sort of knew what was going on. I could hear Russ Hodges' voice, and uh, I was in another room, and I was reading a newspaper, and, and I was very, uh, very directed in in reading the newspaper. I, I always love to read the newspaper. And I thought that if I kept turning the pages, maybe this last rally might continue. I was a superstitious kid. And I kept turning the paper, turning the pages, hoping I wouldn't run out of pages before they got finished with the rally. <laughs> and I heard Russ Hodges yell, and I heard my father yell, and I ran into the kitchen where he was listening to the game. And we started dancing. My dad and I started dancing because we were all so we were so thrilled and so happy with that moment. And it's a moment I'll oh, never wow. forget if I live to be a hundred. Wow, um, Hal, this is a time we've talked about this on the radio to talk about box score. How the, how your column came to be named that 
And I say that speaking of your dad. Tell tell that story, if you will. Well, when I got to college, I, I knew I wanted to write. I, I knew I wanted to go into journalism. I majored in journalism at New York University, and I ran as fast as I could get there to the student newspaper, and uh, worked on the student newspaper. It was called Square Journal, and uh, I worked on the student newspaper for a couple of years. And and by the third year, or maybe the fourth year, I don't recall. Uh, they decided that I could have a column. Editors would get a column. I was a managing editor at the time, and uh, we could have columns. And all the columns had titles. So that was the school is located at Washington Square in Greenwich Village. So all of the columnists used square, the square speaking and on the square and stuff like that. But I wanted right. something different. And so my dad, who... He was a very smart man. He was a very bright guy. He uh, worked hard all his life as a mailman, but he had literary ambitions when he was a young man. And so I said, Dad, I need a title for my column. And he looked at me and he said, what's it about? I said, well, it's, it's you know, a column, a general column, uh, but you know that I'm into sports, uh, so let's see what we can come up with. And it took him maybe five minutes, and he said, you call the column Box Score, B-O-C-K apostrophe S, and it's a play on words. It's a play on baseball, basketball, football, box scores. And right. I thought that was brilliant. And so uh, I used that column name at NYU. I used it as a professional with the Associated Press for many years. And I've used it in retirement as, as a uh, freelance columnist for various publications. So I tried to keep my father's memory alive that way. So that's right. the derivation of box score. That is a, a great story. Would you tell me a Willie Mays story that uh, sticks in your memory? One of the things, well, Willie was uh, Willie was a great fielder. Everybody remembers the catch in the 1954 World Series. And I had no opportunity to interview Willie. For one reason or another, I never got around to interviewing Willie until well after he had retired. And uh, he, was, he was an older man. And... Uh, he was in town for some event or other, and, and I interviewed him. And I decided to ask him about the catch, because it's it's one of the most famous plays in World Series history. And uh, to review, uh, Vic Wirtz was the hitter, and he hit the ball to dead center field in Polo Grounds. And the Polo Grounds was an oddly shaped uh, ballpark. You could hit the ball 257 feet down the line and have a home run, and you could hit the ball 460 feet to center field, and it get caught. So that's what happened to Vic Words. He hit the ball straight away center field. Willie took off, running with his back to the plate, and caught the ball, and it was an amazing play. And I asked Willie about it, and he looked at me, and he said, it was no big deal, because he had played high school football, and he said it was like running out for a pass. It was like I was a wide receiver running out for a pass. And I thought that was very interesting. I had never seen that explanation before. Uh, so that's one of the memorable plays. I, I remember Willie as a defensive player. I mean, it's a great hitter. He hit 660 career home runs. But I remember his defensive prowess. Uh, I remember a play during the, the pennant race in 51 when they needed virtually needed to win every game. They went 37-7 and seven down the stretch. And they had a game at the Polo Grounds against the Dodgers. And I think it was either Billy Cox or Carl Farillo on third base. I think it was Cox. I think it was Billy Billy Cox. If I you know the play I'm talking about. Or story correctly. Uh, the ball is hit the right field, and Don Mueller was the Met, of the the Mets, the Giants' right fielder, and he was a nice hitter, a very nice hitter, Mandrake the magician, good hitter, right? Number two, Adequate two. fielder, and the ball is coming to. Mueller. Here comes Willie Mays on a run, puts his glove up, takes the ball away from Mueller, catches the ball right on, virtually out of Mueller's mitt, whirls and throws a strike to home plate. Westrom is waiting with the ball and puts it right in Cox's ribs for a double play. And I thought to myself, this is a special player. This is something, this is, <laughs> right. you don't see plays like that, you know? Uh, I saw that, I did see that one on television, so... Willie was uh, an, exceptional, had, an exceptional. He had a player. flair. Yes, he certainly did. What was the best way to describe? He himself described himself as an entertainer. 
Gee, well, know. he was. He was then. And uh, um, what a great hitter. I mean, what a great, what a great athlete. He's easily the best I ever saw. And, I mean, I saw a lot of them, uh, but he's easily the best ball player I ever saw. Um, when Willie had the basket catch, everybody thought for a long time that that was just a um, show business type thing. Mm -hmm. But you know what? When he caught the ball at at waist level, he was he described this later. He was able to transfer it more easily to get in throwing position than if he caught the ball up high. Now I I can't explain it like he does, but just uh, the way he got rid of the ball. And when you describe the catch, first of all, that was the first game of the 1951 World Series, and it basically set the tone for the whole series. That, Which that they catch, swept. 54 itself. World Series. But, but it was the throw that was absolutely amazing. If yeah. you look at the clip, he catches the ball, as you say, back to the plate and whirls around and falls down throwing the ball. He was off his feet when he he delivered that baseball, and he kept the runners in scoring position. I still have in my mind's eye um, from the clippings. Um, I'm a, uh, I didn't see it in, in person, obviously, but um, I see Al Rosen scampering back to first base, and. Um, and I hear Don Little uh, coming off the mound. <laughs> I got my man. <laughs> I got my man. <laughs> it's great to it's great to be a former New York Giant fan because we have the memory of sitting out in that cathedral of a ballpark. Yep. It it was really something special. Would you describe the Polo Grounds to me? Uh, the first word that comes to my mind is oddly shaped. There are two words, oddly shaped. Uh, it was uh, it was like a bathtub. I mean, it was uh, oval. It was an oval. And mm -hmm. as I said earlier, uh, the foul lines on the left field and the right field lines were easy pot shots. I mean, they were like 257 feet. And going straight away to center field, you could hit the ball 460 feet and be out. Uh, it was a very strange ballpark. Plus, they had the clubhouses in center field, and to get to the clubhouse, you know, modern baseball stadiums, everything is underground and behind the scenes and stuff. But to get to the clubhouse and the polo grounds, you had to walk from the pitcher's mound, if you were knocked out, straight to center field. And I remember, like, my mind's eye, I can see it now. I've seen film of it enough. Don Newcomb, who was the pitcher for the Dodgers in that, third and final uh, playoff game in 1951, handing the ball to Ralph Branca and making that long walk to the clubhouse yes. uh, while Branca warmed up to pitch to Bobby Thompson. And uh, then I, the Dodgers, the whole Dodger franchise, walking off the field as the Giants celebrated Thompson's home run. So the ballpark was a very strange, uh, strangely constructed place. And it was there for Al, my memory years. of, there of those Dodgers walking off the field, the, the only one that didn't walk off right away was Jackie Robinson. And I have right. a picture on my wall in, in the studio here of him with his hands on his hips watching to make sure that Branca touched all the bases. Bobby, Bobby uh, Thompson. I'm sorry, Bobby Thompson touched all the bases. And I have, too, a memory of Branca, after he gave up the home run, sprawled out on those stairs. That on the clubhouse the steps, clubhouse. yes. And he was just absolutely in shock. Um, well, because you have to remember, uh, Ralph, that the rivalry between the Giants and the Dodgers, it wasn't just two National League teams. I mean, they happened to play in the same city. And the, the players really disliked one another. 
and uh, there was a great, tremendous rivalry and almost a hatred for each other. And that's why the the emotions that uh, spilled over when Bobby Thompson hit the home run were so great. Uh, you can remember Eddie Stanky running out of the Giants' dugout and, and wrestling with Leo DeRocher in the third base coach's box. Uh, right. Part of the film. So he of wouldn't Bobby. interfere, and he let him get around the bases. Yes, yes, he did. But, uh, you know, there was a great emotion uh, because these two teams, they played 22 times in those days, and they played in the same city. So the the uh, emotions ran high on both sides. And uh, you were on the – I was on the – more times than I can remember on the street corner arguing about Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, which is the best. Oh, actor. right. And that great uh, balladeer, Terry Cashman, wrote – uh, talking baseball, and Willie Mickey and the Duke are the centerpiece of that uh, that great song. So uh, it was a, it was a great time in New York. It was a fun time to grow up. Snyder was damn near as good as those two, wasn't he? Was Musial? S- Snyder was oh, damn Duke. near as good I, as. Well, yeah, I mean, all man. three of them in the Hall of Fame. And right. Snyder, but Snyder benefited, in my mind, because he was a left-handed hitter. And the Dodger lineup, Campanella, Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese, Gil Hodges, they were all right-handed hitters. So right. he would benefit from facing a right-handed pitcher because opposition teams would throw righties at the Dodgers, figuring they have that whole lineup of right-handed hitters. We can neutralize them. Well, you couldn't neutralize them. They were great hitters. Most of them are in the Hall of Fame. <clears throat> so, uh, but I, I always felt that the, the Duke uh, benefited from being a left-handed hitter, and he also had a short porch at Ebbets Field. So, how I, uh, I was thinking when we were talking about band, I was thinking about the circumstances we touched on uh, Willie and Mickey being banned by Bowie Kuhn. What were the circumstances around that? Well, uh, they had retired from baseball. They had, their, base, their playing days were behind them, and they were out of the game. And so they had to make a living. You have to make a living. So they both took jobs working at Atlantic City casinos, uh, not rolling, uh, rolling dice or anything, but just as greeters and uh, playing golf with customers and stuff like that, goodwill ambassadors. And Bowie Kuhn decided that uh, baseball could have nothing to do with casinos, with base, with uh, betting uh, casinos, gambling casinos. And so because Willie and, and Mickey were working for casinos, he banned them from baseball. And that was a harebrained idea. I mean, I, I thought Bowie was a pretty good commissioner, all things considered. But that was a, kind of a stupid thing to do. Because Willie and, and Mickey were American icons, and by banning them, you were really uh, setting yourself up to be criticized, and he was. And one of the first things that Peter Uberoff did when he succeeded Kuhn as commissioner in, uh, I guess it was 1984, uh, he reinstated both Willie and uh, Mickey uh, and to the good good graces of baseball and and. Uh, Willie works for the Giants, still works for the Giants, and, and Mickey, of course, is deceased, but he, uh, he worked for the Yankees for a while. So, uh, you know, that's the story of two of the greatest players in the history of the game being banned. So if they could ban them, they could ban anybody, I guess. All right. Well, they can't ban us. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in it anyway. Thank you, my friend. Uh, uh, please come back uh, often and... Uh, Regale us with more stories. It's wonderful, Hal, to have you part of the Comfortably Zone Network. I'm happy to do it. All right. You stay healthy. Continue to recover from your um, cataract surgery, which you tell me went. Uh, you told me went smoothly. I'm so happy. Yes, about it that. did. Yes, it did. Good. Stay healthy, friend. All right. Thanks, my friend. Stay All well. All right. Talk soon. Thank you All for right. listening. Hal Bach, Associated Press, speaking of icons, 43 years, baseball writer. Good night, everybody. Himself.
Be well. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.